So um, we just want to let our pastors know how much we appreciate them. So he said it might go wrong. It's going to go wrong today, period, okay? Because the video is a little lengthy, but we wanted to be able to share it. Jill and Kevin, 
Eli. <laughs> hey, thank you guys so much for everything that you do for our youth. And my little spooky two over here truly love you guys. And thank you so much for everything. And I love you. Bye. Bye. Uh, after the show coming here, we really appreciate what you do. Uh, I remember when I was a kid growing up that my dad never had Sunday school. He never had anything to do uh, with young children or young people. Nothing against that. But uh, I stuck across the road one time, went to the church uh, called Buzzy Hill. And at that time, at nine years old, I finally realized what all the stories of the Bible was. Uh, nobody ever took time to explain it to me. Uh, so what you're doing uh, with these kids and truth seekers, uh, we just don't see the seed growing. But for me, I still remember my first Sunday school teacher many, many years ago. Uh, so these kids will remember you. Uh, for the rest of their lives. Keep doing God's work and uh, keep having fun with it because that's what it's all about. Having fun with the kids and learning about God. I want to say thank you to Jonathan, Amanda, Kevin, and Jill for, make, for loving me, caring about me, and making me feel like I'm a part of your own families. The love you have shown me and how you have accepted me has made me feel at home at this church. Um, your love for God has also inspired me to, better per to be a better person myself. You guys have lifted me up and supported me not only in my walk with God, but also in my games, at my academic endeavors, at prom, at graduation, you guys have just always been there. And I don't think you know how much that means to me. Um, I've never had pastors think, like be a part of my life like you guys have, and it just, it makes me feel like I'm actually loved and cared about, and I haven't felt like that ever before at a church. Um, you, you've also reached out to me when it felt like my world was falling apart, and I'm just forever thankful for you guys, and I love you all. Hi. I want to thank Amanda for always being so kind and caring towards me and my sister and my mom, always asking how we are and things. And I want to thank Jonathan for um, just being there and for always keeping me accountable and for always trying to make my perspective better within Christ. I'd like to thank Kevin for... Um, he's really funny, and um, I love going to youth things with him, and he, Kevin's really nice, and Jill, you are really cool, I love all your jokes that you have, and you're just an outgoing person who loves God, and you guys mean a lot to me and my family, and I just thank you for all that you've done for us. Hey guys, we just want to say thank you. Um, thank you, Pastor Jonathan, for doing everything that you've helped with our house and helped with us spiritually. Amanda, thank you for listening to me complain several different times over the past year from building this house. Um, your smile is contagious, and I'm just so thankful for both of you. And I want to say thank you, Jonathan, for your love for the Word of God and for your messages and for how they uplift and encourage um, and prod us on to be better in Christ. And thank you for your servant's heart and for mingling with the people and your heart for evangelism and reaching out to people. I think that's awesome. And uh, also, uh, Amanda, I appreciate you and uh, your love for Jesus and your friendliness toward people and the way you love on our kids. And uh, we're just thankful for Zach and Abby as well, and their heart to, to love on people as well and to be used by God. Jonathan, I wanted to drop in to you and Amanda to, to express my gratitude to you guys. Forever grateful. God bless you. I love you guys. Hey there. Jonathan, Amanda, Kevin, and Jill. Just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate you and love you, and I'm just so thankful that I'm a member of the herd. Um, it's just awesome, the things that you do. And um, I just wanted to, uh, to say, Jonathan, that um, without Amanda by your side, you would just be on a long, just so you know. Uh, so thanks again. Hey, Jonathan, Amanda, Abby, and Zach, it's us, the Ryans. Hey! Hi. 
Hey guys, we would just like to say truly thank you guys so much for everything that you have done for us. And we love you and thank you for being such great role models for all of us to follow, to show the love of Christ into the world. We love you guys. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan and Amanda. Happy Pastor Appreciation Month. I want to just give my little um, thank you for all that you guys have done for me and my family. Thank you for praying for me, for sending messages, um, just to check on us when things were bad, and for coming and helping us with um, our house build. And Amanda, thank you for being a good friend and for um, always talking to me and checking in on me. You guys really do mean the world to me and um, for the Emmaus walk and everything. And Jill and Kevin, same thing with you. Um, Jill, if it wasn't for you, I never would have found Hill, um, Hill's Chapel. You invited me when um, my life wasn't going so well. So thank you for doing, um, inviting me to those women's studies that um, McKinley put on and, um, and including me. And I am ever so grateful for the Emmaus walk. Um, that meant the world to me, and it was directly for me. So thank you for that. And Kevin, thank you for coming and helping Josh and letting him borrow your tools. And um, I'm glad that he finally gave them back to you after such a long time. I love okay. you guys. Shout out to Pastor Appreciation um, and tell you guys how much you mean to us. And um, that we love you, and um, Jonathan and Amanda and Kevin and Joe mean a lot to us, um, and we just want you guys to know how much we appreciate you. I also want to let you both know, well, all of you know, uh, how grateful I am for the accountability and uh, how much of an impact it's made in my life, and how grateful I am that you guys are. We love you. I just want to give another shout out to Kevin and Jill Marshall. Uh, of course, we love you guys. Um, we got to know you guys through cross country, but really, uh, I didn't get to know you until we did small groups because, uh, you know, I was running around everywhere during cross country. But um, small groups with uh, Harry and Mackenzie, so I really got to know you and I got to talk to you uh, about things you usually don't open up to people about, and you just took it with. Stride. So I just thank you for that. And Kevin, you're hilarious, and I love that you're competitive just like me. And you're great with the kids, and you involve them with everything. And of course, you know, we love your kids and all of you guys. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> thank you guys so much. We appreciate you, Jonathan and Amanda and Jill and Kevin, occasionally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Wilson and our little Danish girl. And we just wanted to take time to tell you how much we appreciate and thank everything that you guys do. So, uh, what I like about um, Jill is that she lets us stay at um, our house whenever she has like a uh, And what I like about Kevin is that he has really, 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 and when I first came to the church, like when I just came over here, I really appreciated how you guys were open and really came and just took me along. And it wasn't that hard for me to do what I to do. And, yeah. and when I first came to the church, I appreciate how Jonathan is that no excuse. Words and never let anyone fall ever. Um, we guys um, been my best friend for a while, and I'm just thankful for your relationship. And we're always making Black Friday a uh, treat. Um, thankful for Kevin um, and just um, keeping it weird, juice and uh, wild. Um, we love your jokes, even if they are bad guys. <laughs> and uh, Jill, thank you. Um, it's been fun getting to know you, and um, I love um, our relationship that I can talk to you about anything. Thanks for helping me learn how to take compliments from my husband. Um, we love you. Hey guys, seriously, um, we can't even express 
how much we appreciate all you do uh, for the church and for us. A lot of it does go unnoticed, um, and I appreciate your friendships as well. Uh, but above all of that, the thing that I appreciate the most about, it, about above anything else is uh, buffalo chicken dip. Okay, so Jill, in case you forget where we live, we live in Mount Hope by this camp. It's a great house on the drive. Feel free to drive off buffalo any time. Any time. But in all seriousness, have a great uh, pastor appreciation day. Thanks, guys. Love you. church we have um, cake and ice cream for Jonathan of course <laughs> I, the ice cream for Jonathan <laughs>
um, so I go to this women's conference, and, and you know, and, I, and I've thought about this a lot over the last couple weeks, but like what Jonathan said about being obedient and stuff like that. Um, so I was there, and at the beginning, you know, God was speaking to my heart, saying, you know, you need to give them something and everything, and you know, again, I kind of, like, I forgot that I was in my pocket. Well, so anyway, so I went to the bathroom and reached in my pocket and was there, and pulled it out and God said, you need to give that. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> you know, are you, are you, are you sure? Like, this is a fresh, crisp, I don't know, like, I struggled it, and he spoke once. So the rest of the time, the, I mean, like, full of this is a six-hour conference, so the rest of the time I'm in my head, God, are you sure? You know what I mean? And like he, he's and like like I said, he spoke once. And I'm like, man, I wish I had some smaller bills than my. And then, then I realized I had that twice. So now it's a real conflict. <laughs> like because I'm like, ooh, it, it'd be much easier to give this, but you know, and I'm like, God, did you really say that? You know, and I'm basically just having this conversation with myself because he just, I don't know, he's setting up her waiting or what. <laughs> but so finally, I kind of, I, I, I kind of bite the bullet, <laughs> and which I did give from a cheerful heart. You know, it wasn't it that I <coughs> questioned that, like God did you tell me? So I gave it to her. She stuck it in her Bible, didn't even look at it or nothing else, right? So then later. We were having a conversation. She had borrowed her son's birthday money. She had been, she was this exact amount short on what they needed for their conference. She had borrowed her son's birthday money. She had missed work half the week because she was preparing for the conference. Anyway, she's, she's like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. How I'm going to make this up. And, and um, it was the exact amount that she needed. And see, I didn't know. So then I walked away like, you know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm just like, whatever. And then, um, so then when I heard that, I cried. I bawled. I was like, what if I wouldn't have been obedient? Because that blessing meant so much to her. And I'm telling you what, I never won nothing in my life. <laughs> and I won Mount Hope gift card. You know what I mean? And, you know, I've always been a firm believer. You cannot outgive God. You cannot. Like, I've literally tried. You can. And, you know, it's so funny that, that God would use something like, you know, now I hope. And so I went into the other gift card. Then when I get it, when my name flashes the card, because I have my name in my name. So when that notification popped up and it said, Don't fear it all. But in my spirit, I heard, the homeless people need that. So I was like, okay, that's awesome. Well, I never expected to that. You know, God, but you let me do that because then, he, then I get a message that evening and that says, I've got uh, 50 and 40 to give you to the homeless. So I'm like, okay, God. But, um, so I just want to thank him for that. And I just, you know, want to encourage. Because I think that tithing and offering and stuff like that was something that God taught me early, early on. And like I said, if I didn't feel led to, to say this, I, I wouldn't be. But, um, and I know, and I've said before, like Jonathan never preaches on tithes and stuff. And I think it's an important um, principle in the Bible, an important, important lesson. And sometimes it is. You know, it was hard for me to come off that money. But, I mean, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Just like Jonathan talked about going and telling that guy I love you. That's some really awkward stuff. What Brett asked us to do in that video, that was some really awkward stuff. <laughs> and I could see it wasn't just me, you know, but sometimes that, that kind of stuff is so meaningful. And, um, you know, I feel like um, when we are, God will teach us to tie. He will teach us to give and he will teach us to be obedient and um, <coughs> I know that since I have learned that principle, like, like that, that, that happened, that whole story, you know what I mean? I can tell you a hundred others, just like it. And, um, but I'm thankful that.
guys have taught me uh, so much through that. You know what I mean? You check me on being the middle because there was this little lady about this tall, all dressed in a nice suit jacket, and I got all the way. She's not going to scream me. She was a firecracker. Let me tell you what, it was like two straight hours. Uh, we had about 100 scriptures, and she goes, get to them all. Read them all, right? <laughs> And I mean, it was so it was so refreshing, and to be around those women. There's something about women who have just been through, and you know, we get together and just start praising God. It's it's amazing when things happen. So I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful also for the church and and for my church family. Somebody else this morning.
anybody now. I, I'm not taking my stuff back in. <laughs> share with us this morning about their ministry. días, yo sé que todos me van a escuchar en español, y creo que entienden muy bien cada palabra que estoy hablando, así que no se preocupen. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Wow, ok. Uh, my name is Gerson Tejeda. It was a long time, like six years. And when I when we were driving this and oh yeah that's the church now I remember. <laughs> <coughs> um, thank you for um, hey what a church I said because I was very wow this church love his pastor his leadership let's give God a big a huge clap for the pastor. Everybody? 
It's not Sunday school. I have, I have some cameras up there if you'd say that. <laughs> that means owner, my owner, owner. So every time when you read your Bible, owner. Okay? But, si, si, Señor, Señor, Amen. 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 Coming? 
finding the pathway. So, um, so there are now five of us. There we go. There we go. Got us now. So uh, Jaden is ten, Edson is eight, and then Hadassah is three and a half. I also want to say our family has been blessed by different people in this congregation who are at Mount Hope this summer. When I came to Mount Hope, it was very difficult. Jerson had just lost his mom in Bolivia and had to go to Bolivia. Well, didn't have to. The Lord blessed him and he was able to go for the funeral. And uh, that was the week that we were we were planning it being about hope. And I'm telling you, the people from this congregation that were there that week that rallied around me is a huge testimony of the love. And of, I mean, of just the love of God flowing to you guys. And I personally am in a much better place now than I was then. And I want to thank you for pouring into me that week when I was pretty empty and pretty rock bottom. Uh, you guys poured into me, and I want to thank you and acknowledge that. <clears throat> We serve on the Texas-Mexico border um, down in McAllen, and I'm sorry you all never got there. It was a series of unfortunate events that all worked for the good, right? But I want to encourage you all that you're still welcome to come anytime. But we do live way down in McAllen, way, way, way down. When we tell people that, they don't realize how big Texas is. To give you an idea, the first time we drove with our U-Haul from Illinois, we got to the Texas border and we all cheered, yay! And then we looked at our GPS, we're only halfway there. <laughs> so we are like way down in the tip. Uh, I claim Indiana as my home and the motto of Indiana is Crossroads of America. I am dubbing McAllen Crossroads of the World. <laughs> if you watch any news or you're on social media at all, you know that there is what they are calling the immigration crisis happening, and we are at ground zero of that immigration crisis right where we live. Some people have very strong opinions about this. Just get me on social media about five minutes. But I want you to, I want you to think about what Scripture says. Psalm 96.2 says, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. God has a heart for the nations. Why did he call Abraham away and develop his own nation, Israelites, so they would be a peculiar people, so they would stand out, they would be different, they would be a testimony to the nations because God has a heart for the nations. If you look, I asked my, I asked my staff real quick, the missionaries on my staff, I said, guys, write a quick list of the countries you know you've touched through the ministries here on the border. And we came up with 18 pretty quickly. If you look at this list, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Colombia, Bolivia, Spain, Romania, Korea, Philippines, Canada, Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, Madagascar, and China, that's a quick list of the nations, of the people who are coming that we have been able to directly have contact with amongst our staff of missionaries. Now, some people might go, huh, there's a lot of countries coming over here. Well, I want, to, I, want you to, I want you to think, what does the Bible say? His ways are what? Higher than our ways. His thoughts are? Higher than our thoughts. I probably can never get a visa to go to China. But if a Chinese comes to this United States where there are churches, where he can be led to Jesus, disciples for Jesus, can he go back to his own country? A lot easier than you are, can. And that's true of a lot of these countries that we're able to impact. And I just think, God's ways are so much higher than mine. His thoughts are so much higher than mine. What is our obligation as missionaries right there? Is to be the hands and feet of Jesus to anyone who crosses our path, regardless of their situation or where they come from. One lady that I just want to tell you a quick story about, Dulce, has become so dear to me. She came into my office in May, and we left June 1st, and about April or May, she came into my office, and she said, Betsy, I have a problem. I don't like when people come into my office and say, I have a problem, because immediately I'm like, how big a problem are we talking? And she said, my church wants me to be the children's director. Now, I don't know about you, but I breathed a huge sigh of relief, and I went, that's not a problem! <laughs> That's an opportunity. Like, are you kidding me? And I looked at her and I said, that's awesome. What's the problem with that? And she says, I'm not trained. I don't know what 
to do. How can I teach children? And I was able to look at Ilse and say, I was there when you met Jesus. And if you have Jesus, he equips you for everything he tells you to do. And so therefore, if they're asking you to be the children's director, if he's saying do it, you walk in obedience. And you take that position. And you do it for Jesus. And he will equip you in every way you need to be equipped. Dulce was led to the Lord through a work team. This is what I want to encourage you guys. That if the Lord, if you feel the tug of your heart to come, go on a work team, whether it's to us or somewhere else, do it. You know what impacted her about the work team that was there? They came from Indiana and they took vacation time. And they paid. They weren't getting paid to be there. To love on her and her family. Who does that? So peculiar in a world where it's all about status and making money and getting higher in your job. Who takes a week of vacation to go serve somewhere and pays to do it? Peculiar. A peculiar people. Different. That's what we're called to be. Different in a world um, that, that is surrounding us. <clears throat> do say I called her oh, the end of June. I said, do say, how you doing? Because I knew she just had her first big assignment as children's leader. Guess what it was, if it's in June? VBS. Yeah, nothing like, here's children's director, to the VBS. <laughs> I said, how'd it go? She goes, I led three little girls to Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. I said, do say, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Martina's family. Um, you see the little boy in the white? Jerison is a soccer coach. That's the main ministry Jerison works with is soccer. Getting kids off the street, youth and adult, youth and um, children, and teaching them biblical principles through the game of soccer. Okay? He, um, this little kid here, was a fright. Um, when he came, it was terrifying to all of us. He, he's, he asked my children. He, he's a little spitfire. And, but bless his heart, um, he came to soccer, his mom would drop him off, and Jerison told the mom, you know what, you just go on your way, come back and pick him up in an hour, leave him with me, it'll go better if you're not here. <laughs> Most of the parents stay on the soccer field because we get to develop relationships with them and friendships with them as they play soccer, but with his mom, we were like, it's better if you're not here. Then Jerison can discipline and, and, and try to get him to listen without your influence, and she was good with that, so she left. Well... At the end of each soccer season, we have an award ceremony. And one uh, year, Jerison came to me and said, Betsy, I think we need to do something different. Let's ask our church, our home church, if we can use their gym to do the ceremony. There were two reasons for this. One, our church gym was, had air conditioning, and it's like 113 degrees in May. We, were, we really wanted air conditioning. We thought that might help more families show up. And number two, which was the primary reason, was because if families enter a church property when it's not a normal service, then if they want to go to church, they're more likely to go to that church and enter the doors of the sanctuary. And so we went to our leadership team at the church. We said, can we use the gym? We'll rent it, whatever. They didn't make us rent it. They gave it to us and said, you're a ministry. We'll let you do this. We were able to use that gym, and we had the children's leader come up and give the different programs that our church offers for children, the Sunday school class and the Iwana program, hoping that it would draw fruit and that families would come to our church. Even though we'd invited them, we thought this might be a way to get them inside the church building. Jerison was leading worship in the Spanish service, looked out in the audience, and saw this family sitting in a pew one day. And his jaw just dropped. He said he had, like lost his place in the song because he was like, am I seeing things right? We went up to the Martinez family afterwards to Mom Martinez, and I said, why? Why did you choose to come to our church? And she said, well, you, we have an older son you've never met. He's going down a wayward path, making really bad decisions. And she said, I know God can make a difference. And I went to my husband and said, would you be willing to take all the rest of our kids to church? We need, we need a change. Or they're going to choose the same way our older son has. And he said, you know what, if you think it's going to make a difference, let's do it. So she was the catalyst. And he said, where are we going to go? And she said, well, you remember Coach? Coach's church? Let's go to that church, and at least we'll see a familiar face. And sure enough, they came, and they're still attending. Moms accepted the Lord. I don't know about the rest of them, 
but they're coming every time the church doors are open. I love what you said about these kids being in sports and academics and band and all these different things because it makes a difference when we're a peculiar people and we live differently than the world around us. People notice. And all of you young people that are in school, people notice when you shine for Jesus. You are making an impact. And I want to encourage you in that. We're a peculiar people. We're different. I've already mentioned our ministries, but uh, we have evangelism through sports, which is mostly soccer. And then we have the Sparrow's Nest, where we reach a lot of immigrant families, low-income families, with um, clothing and food items. And then we have the, um, the field leadership. Over the last about five years, I've been in some way, shape, or form involved in field leadership. In the last three years, I've been the field director, which is the leader of the whole team and the ministries. The Lord is asking me to step, that, step out of that for our next term, so I would ask one prayer request is for the Lord to put in the new leader that he wants for our team. I struggled with that. When God asks us to do something hard, there's a surrendering and a refining process. That's where I found myself when he asked me this, because my heart is with the sparrow's nest and with the mamas on the soccer field and with people. And I was kind of in this cubicle where I had to do a lot of administration over the last three years. But I found that through that, my, God had to change my mind, that he wasn't calling me to the people outside, but instead he was calling me to minister to my missionary staff and to love on them and to pour into them. And it was a huge paradigm shift for me. But through it, the victories, the things that I got to see were incredible. Even though McAllen is in the United States, I told you we're literally able to reach nations for Christ. 85% of the population do not even claim Christianity. They don't even claim to be evangelical Christians. So of the ones that actually put it on a survey that they're Christians, how many of them do you think are really the peculiar people? The people that are really shining a light for Jesus in our community. It's a very, very small percentage. Pray for us as we minister and we um, try to reach this community for Jesus. You guys have heard all of this before, so this is not new. This is where I said I almost feel like you've given, you've given the message this morning. But go. You know, when, when we say, when missionaries say go, you automatically think God's calling you to missionary. You have missionaries right here in your congregation. Sometimes going isn't as far as you think. I don't want to dismiss that there may be someone in here that God is asking to go, like Destiny. I met Destiny this summer. Okay? Sometimes God really says, go to another nation. Go across the sea. Go to a different continent. Or like us, go to a different state. Okay? Go. But here's what I want to leave with you about this go statement. This is a passage you've probably never heard with missions. <clears throat> Second Kings 7. I was reading a Bible story to my kids one night, and I was floored by this passage, which I've read before, but never had it in this light before. There's a siege in Samaria, okay? No food's going in. No food's coming out. Nobody's coming out. Nothing's going in. The enemy has surrounded it. Nothing is happening except for starvation within the walls. Three lepers are outside the city gate. And the three lepers are starving. And they said, we can't go in, there's no food. If we go, if we stay here, we'll die. So they have this great idea. Let's go to the enemy camp and see if they have food. The worst they can do is kill us. Then we're better off than we are now. Slowly dying. They go to the enemy camp. And what, what they realize when they get there is there's nobody there. Because God had done a miracle and sent an angel army to scare them off. The enemy had scattered, leaving all their, all their stuff. All their gold, all their food, everything. They had fled in confusion. So these lepers go in and begin eating and eating and eating. And then it gets to verse 9 and it says, They said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we're keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. And they left everything 
And they ran back to the walls and said, guys, there's no enemy. Come, there's food. There's food. You don't have to starve. And I think to myself, where are we as a church in the United States? Now, I've heard y'all. I think you guys are peculiar people. I want to encourage you. What Jonathan said when he got up here this morning and said he heard God say, go tell him I love him. There is a world out there that is starving spiritually. They may have the biggest paycheck and the biggest house and five cars. They may not. But they don't have the most important thing. They are starving spiritually. And we, as God's peculiar people, have the food that they're looking for and don't even know most of the time. They're trying to fulfill it in drugs and alcohol, money, success, women, men, partying, you name it. And they're trying to fill the void that they have. But they are starving. And we know they're starving. And we have the answer. And we can be like those lepers and leave the comfort of being inside a church where everybody loves each other, where we're comfortable. And we can go out there and say, what we're doing is not right, keeping it here. Let's go out. Let's go out and compel people to come in where they can find spiritual food for their hunger. I want to encourage you guys to do that. And I don't know what that means for each of you. For some of you, it'll be in your sports teams. For some of you, it'll be at your workplace. For some of you, it'll be your next-door neighbor. And some of you, it might be your family members. And for some of you in here, God might be calling you to full-time ministry. <gasps> but ask, God, what am I supposed to do with this go? Just go. The next one is give. And I, you already said it. This is what I use in every, in every church we go to. You can't outgive God. So I said, I feel like I've already preached the message here. This is the testimony. You can't outgive God. We've tried it. We've tried to God give God. You can't do it because he owns everything. He's the Lord. He's the owner. He owns our finances. He owns our homes. He owns our cars. He owns our family. He owns the ministries that we're part of. He owns the church. He owns it all. So how can we be tight-fisted with what he's given us? He didn't give to us to keep. He gave to us to bless. Um, he gave it all. He gave his life. John 3, 16. Go back and look at it. So far, he hasn't asked me to give my life in the sense of death. But he asked each of us to give our lives and surrender to what he wants. And sometimes that's finan financial. We have a goal of getting seven individuals, churches, Sunday school classes, small groups, seven, to give $75 per month. So it's an ongoing, reoccurring gift. In order for us to get to the field, we need seven people to give $75, and we need seven commitments per month. Does that make sense? It's kind of confusing. But that's what we need to get us back to the field by the time school starts in the fall. So I have a prayer card in the back, and you guys are familiar with these, I'm sure. There's prayer cards back there on our table. Okay? And um, you can pick those up. We'd love everyone to take one to pray for us. But on there is also a response card if you feel God is asking you to give financially to us and the ministry God's called us to. There's also a way to do it online, folks. WJ makes it so easy now. You can just get online and set it up. And if you don't know how to do that, we can walk you through the process if there's internet here. We're having trouble with internet. But um, if you have internet, you can do it online. And then pray. Prayer is so key. On the back table, we have a bookmark. And on the back of it, it has prayer requests for every day of the week for our family and for the ministries of McAllen. And I want to challenge you to pick that up and to put it in your Bible. And as you do your daily devotions, just pray for our family. We are traveling an insane amount of miles this year. Our kids are undergoing homeschooling, major transition every week. We go to a new church with new Sunday school, new people, and it is tough on kids. Pray for our kids. And then Luke 10.2. 10, Does anyone know what Luke 10.2 says? I feel like my husband would be like, chocolate for everyone. I really don't. I have mint in the back. Nobody knows what Luke 10.2 says? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. 
You know, I told you God owns it all. But the one time in scripture he lacks something, it has to do with our will. <laughs> he calls, but we have to say yes. He's not going to force it because he loves, and love doesn't force. So if you think about that for a minute, the one place where, where God lacks something is workers. And he says, what are we supposed to do about it? We're supposed to pray that he sends workers. So we have on our phones, we turn them off today, but... On our phones, 10.02, an alarm goes off, and we stop and we pray just for five seconds. Our kids know it, too. The alarm goes off, and they say, oh, we're supposed to pray for workers. Yep. So we just, wherever we're at in the grocery store, we did it in an antique store in southern Illinois one day, and the antique owner came over. What do you do? We're praying. He joined us. We found out he was a fellow believer. He put it on his phone. It's an incredible way, again, to be peculiar. Who stops in the middle of the grocery store and prays? <laughs> we do it. Okay. And it leads to incredible conversations. And God has grown our field. We have about 15 full-time missionaries down on the border now. God continues to bring missionaries since we started praying this prayer of God, bring workers. So I want to encourage you guys. God is doing incredible things on the border. You guys are a part of that. You're one of our churches that we consider one of our churches. Um, he's doing incredible things. We're privileged to be a part of it. And I really want to encourage you all. Get a work team together. Let's try this again. Take two. And see if y'all can come and see firsthand. And we are, um, I didn't put this in the presentation, but we really are also helping immigrants. We had a work team there this week. We weren't there. A work team this week went over onto the Mexico side. They got to play soccer with the immigrant kids that are waiting for paperwork to be processed as they apply. We, they were able to hand out water, uh, mattress pads, all sorts of stuff to the immigrants that are in line doing the paperwork to come across because it's a huge crisis. And uh, so if you come and do that and that's still happening, that's something that you would be involved with probably if that's something you're interested in. So thank you. We love you guys. I want to ask Jerison to come up. Um, he has a, a closing song. It's really easy for us sometimes to come to church, to listen, and then to walk off because I know we have ice cream and cake, right? Is that what I heard? Yeah, see, I heard I was listening. <laughs> There's ice cream and cake. And it's really easy to kind of turn our brains off and go, oh, I'm ready for the ice cream and cake. I want you guys, though, to think about those three things specifically. And God may be talking to you about something else, but the go, the give, and the pray. And there is a song that has <coughs> challenged my heart on so many occasions that I want it to minister to you. And I want you guys, as he sings it, if you know it, sing along, if you mean it. Have you guys ever looked at the words of the songs we sing? Sometimes they're scary. This is one of those. But I want you to ask God, what are you asking me to give today? My time, my going, my finances, my time by praying. What are you asking me to do that I'm not surrendered completely to you? Is there anything I'm holding back? And if there is, get it right today. You have an opportunity to make it right this morning. To reconcile and to say, I'm so sorry I've been holding back. And allow him to do what he wants in your life. Like I said, you can't outgive God. He wants us to be in right relationship with him. So let the, I'll let the word speak. And um, yeah, if you've got business to do with the Lord, I'd encourage you to do that this morning. myself away
myself away.